Hello there, welcome to this edition of Global Business Africa. Over the next 30 minutes, we'll make a speed run through all the key business stories you need to know about right across the African continent. And today, from also outside it, we'll be in Scotland on the day they hold a referendum deciding whether or not to finally end the United Kingdom. All that and more is coming up in the next 30 minutes. Here's what's coming up. Abu Dhabi National Petroleum comes in to alleviate Egypt's energy crisis. We'll add the details. The IMF is riding to the rescue of Ghana with its reform program in focus. And we'll have a story of the vibrancy of the Hayalicha Township in South Africa. How it moved an Algerian entrepreneur to support its work. Let's start, however, in Egypt. The country has struck a one-year deal with the United Arab Emirates for essentially the supply of about 65% of that country's petroleum needs for the next 12 months or so. According to the contract, that, of course, is a supply agreement that has been arrived at. Uh, no price has been announced, but an Egyptian official said it is low, quote-unquote, with convenient payment facilities. Now, Egypt, of course, has been plagued by a consistent energy crisis since 2011. Petroleum country, the, the the country's petroleum output has dropped by about 28%. Consumption levels, however, are up about 30%. With a fall in revenues, the country has been enabled to pay for imported petroleum products. It's been building up quite a bit of debt on that. It's now turned to her Saudi Arabia, UAE and Kuwaiti neighbors who supported the country with about $12 billion worth of loans, grants and petroleum products last year. It's not clear, however, if Saudi Arabia will also continue to supply Egypt with petroleum products given the steel announced today with the United Arab Emirates as well. Let's head over live to Cairo, where Yasser Hakim is standing by. He's got more details on this particular deal. Um, Yasser, all Egypt's cabinet said about the price here is that it is appropriate, quote-unquote. Do we have any idea what price this deal is, uh, has been acquired at? There's no formal number given, but uh, in a meeting... Uh, last August, uh, I was speaking to one of those uh, officials at the Ministry of Petroleum and he told me that we expect to, we are negotiating, that Egypt is negotiating a deal worth around $9 billion with the United Arab Emirates. Uh, the, the last deal for last year ended in August, so they were negotiating the new deal for the new year, which, is, which starts in September. Uh, and he said it will be around $9 billion. So I'm assuming this is the deal he was talking about. Uh, last August. Indeed. From Egyptians' positions, however, why single source imports for the next year? Why not just buy out then, enjoy the flexibility of buying crude on the open market? What's the rationale for this move? Uh, it's just about having the means to do so. Uh, the United Arab Emirates, the Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and uh, also Bahrain have been helping out Egypt, giving them. Uh, giving Egypt uh, the, the, this amount it needs at low prices than the open market, than going to the market, and also giving facilities that other countries would not give. And some of the, and, and the, uh, uh, some of the amount was even given as a grant uh, without having to pay for it. So uh, even this time, usually Egypt would go into a tender and then they choose the best bidder or the best person with the best price. This time it was just merely going straight a direct purchase without tenders, without asking for prices, without going into the market. Indeed. Finally, as yes, Egypt already buys anywhere between one and one point three billion dollars worth of petroleum every single month. Will this deal change the quantity that it imports or the price of the same moving forward? Um, Egypt is hoping it can, in the next few years, uh, reduce the quantities. But the price, if you if you calculate it, one point three billion. Uh, makes around 15.8 uh, billion per year uh, and if we assume it's 9 billion uh, by uh, the United Arab Emirates for the United Arab Emirates uh, that's the 65 percent is equal to 11 billion so there's a 2 billion discount uh, by the UAE to Egypt plus uh, as expected and as government uh, officials have said before part of it will be a grant and facilities so the price will actually at the end look much cheaper because there's a two 
billion dollar discount and the facilities and grants in the middle of, of, the, of, of the whole deal. Uh, could it uh, affect the quantity? Maybe Egypt would even more because Egypt consumes more every year until it manages to, to put in, in effect the new uh, renewable energy projects and, and also coal and, and what else. But for now, we expect even more consumption and more imports rather than uh, less. Indeed, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much for that. That's CCTV's Yasser Hakim. They're live in Cairo. Now, story of the day this. Millions in Scotland, about four so million registered, are voting on whether or not the country should stay in the United Kingdom or become an independent state altogether. With over four million people registered to vote, this is expected to be the busiest day in Scotland's electoral history. The results are expected from about 6 a.m. on the 19th of September. Now, the future of not sea oil is one of the key campaign issues since the first licenses were issued for the extraction of oil and gas from the North Sea in 1964. About 42 billion barrels of it have been yanked out of the sea. It's estimated there could be about 24 billion more in, in untapped reserves. The industry employs about 450,000 people across the UK and in, tw in 2012 and 2013. The North Sea oil supplied about 67% of the UK's oil demand in 2012 and 53% of the country's gas requirements, and it is a significant part of the country's economy. If oil revenues are included in GDP figures, Scotland is shown to generate more GDP per capita than the UK as a whole. Let's expand this conversation now. Miriam Bemard is live in London. She's got more perspective on this particular story. Um, Miriam, if Scotland does become an independent state, who exactly gets the oil and gas revenues from the North Sea? Mm, well, Rama, under the present arrangement, the oil tax revenues are actually assigned to an economic region set up by the UK government. The UK has been using what's deemed as the median line for decades, and that also determines boundaries between Scotland and the rest of the UK for things like fisheries. Uh, so if Scotland separates, it will ask for the boundaries to be divided up on a geographical basis. Now, on the economic front, pro-separatists claim that Scotland uh, is entitled to about 90% of the oil production from the North Sea. That was about $49 billion US in 2012. But in the last few years, actually, production has actually dropped. And despite plenty of fossil fuel production, we'll actually have to run deeper. Uh, we'll have to see more operations. And of course, that means raising costs. Now, a number of studies and forecasts are actually warning that tax revenues from North Sea oil will likely shrink in the coming years. But many Scottish policymakers are saying that an additional 24 billion barrels of oil can still be recovered from the North Sea. Indeed. Um, away from oil matters, if Scotland does become independent, let's look at the monetary policy options here. What currency would it use, for example? And is there an agreement on exactly how much of the UK's debt it will take responsibility for? Well, Rama, there's, you know, there's a lot of questions there. The UK national debt is actually expected to peak at about 86% of GDP, almost tr $3 trillion uh, by 2016. Now, the national debt could be distributed by historic contribution made to the UK's public finances by Scotland. Uh, what's, what they would do is, using the 1980 uh, year as the base year, Scotland's historic share of the UK national debt in 2016 is expected to be about $164 billion. Now, this is kind of equivalent to about 55% of the Scottish GDP. Scotland will have a few options, including one, of course, staying with the sterling, but without the support of the Bank of England or any sort of guarantee of its sterling-denominated debt, uh, trade ties would remain untouched with you know, very little disruption. Uh, an independent currency is another option which would face higher transaction costs and, of course, capital flight uh, and fluctuating exchange rates. Or another option would be that, you know, join the euro, uh, but would have to apply to join and have policies set up by the ECB. Indeed, we'll have to leave it there for the time being. But thank you very much for the input. That's uh, Mary and Bema there live in London. Let's rope in Richard Bestick is over in Scotland's uh, parliament at Holyrood. Uh, Richard, give us a sense of what voting has been like today. What's been going on up there? 
Well, it's an extraordinary story, isn't it? Uh, we have the potential for an unprecedented level of turnout. 97% of eligible voters in Scotland have signed up uh, and most of them have told pollsters that they will be voting. So the potential for a huge turnout uh, we know about. Not much more though because the, for the last two weeks the uh, opinion polls have shown this country to be split down the middle. It's part of the consequence of this vote is that win or lose, yes or no, half the nation is going to be angry, the other half is going to be saying thank goodness for that. Uh, there, are, there are considerable downsides. Uh, there is uh, the talk of a constitutional crisis. Oh dear, unfortunately, uh, satellite issues coming in and stopping our content there from Scotland. But we'll keep tabs on that and we'll certainly have the details and the results as they do flow in from about 6 a.m. local time in Scotland tomorrow morning. Let's get back to Africa now. Zambia and Zimbabwe have obtained pledges of about 280 million U.S. dollars to rehabilitate the Kariba Dam. It's a crucial source of electricity built more than five decades ago and right now is in urgent need of maintenance. The EU will provide 100 million dollars. The World Bank and the African Development Bank, $75 million apiece. Sweden, $30 million. The remainder will come from the Zambezi River Authority. The Kariba Dam and the hydroelectric scheme were built across the Zambezi River. They've been central to energy security and economic development in Zambia and Zimbabwe. Rwanda has just finished hosting the fifth senior executive roundtable on sourcing from women-owned enterprises in its capital, Kigali. The event brought together 50-plus decision-makers in governments, corporations, trade support bodies and women's associations as well. Why were they there? To examine the challenges and opportunities to boost procurement levels. To find out what the economic case is for buying specifically from women-owned enterprises, Peter Akaba spoke to Rwanda's Minister of Gender and Family Promotion. Why women? And uh, I think in uh, most of our African countries, but I, uh, all over the world, if you look on the percentage of the population of women in these uh, uh, countries, uh, you obviously have to know why all the sensible governments or states should consider women. Uh, for example, in Rwanda, our population is uh, uh, women constitute more than 52 percent. And uh, this 52 percent contributes a lot in our economic uh, growth and uh, when you look uh, for example in agriculture the agriculture sector is one of our uh, sector which uh, is a pillar for development of our country and we have more than 80 percent are women and when you go to the community the, the, the what these women are contributing if it is in education if it is in health if it is in nutrition but also in production production in agriculture, production uh, uh, in, in, in some of other areas, you find more women, you know, being part of uh, uh, this process. There are women entrepreneurs who have been able to make it despite the challenges that are there even uh, in the market as it is currently. These people need to, so to say, internationalize their businesses, take advantage of opportunities that go beyond borders. What is being done to be able to enable them to take advantage of these opportunities? One, I think, is networking. And uh, what we have been doing is uh, uh, supporting them, first of all, through the uh, Minister of Commerce to identify those opportunities and market around. And we have been connecting them, for example, uh, for women in uh, Chamber of Entrepreneurs, uh, they, have, uh, they are working with uh, other we, they call them mentors in business. So they have them at in US, in uh, UK, and other countries. So these women who have experience in trade, they get connected to our women here so that they can uh, uh, learn what they are go doing, but they can connect them also to the market. But also the good thing I'm, uh, I'm seeing in, uh, within this uh, regional integration is, for example, the, the, the trade fair the Juakali in Kenya uh, and other opportunities whereby our women from Rwanda will go with their products and meet women from Kenya, from Tanzania, from all over East Africa and then they will exchange and through that uh, they, they also access uh, international market. 
Quick run through the equity markets here for you. The JSC in South Africa up about two thirds in trading today, pretty much shrugging off all the uh, news coming in from the monetary policy side. Uh, NASPA's top gain over there. UBS, of course, has changed its rating on that from neutral over to buy. Banks also going up. Net Bank up 1.7%. First Strand also gaining. However, because of gold prices being at about eight month lows, you're seeing all the gold stocks essentially falling. On the other side, the NSC 20 in Kenya. Interesting story here. It shares. The shares of the boss as a whole up eight percent today to 23 shillings and about five cents it's quite a bit of latent demand for those shares we'll keep track on that right here for you Coming up, IMF heading to the rescue once again. Ghana's reform program is in focus as it seeks the IMF's help to plug its deficit. We'll also have a story of how the vibrancy of one township in South Africa moved an Algerian entrepreneur to support its women. Africa is on the move. It's only step of the world's 10 fastest growing economy. We help you make sense of the fast-changing African business landscape. We take you where the business is at. African leaders have been urged to make it easier to move and do business across borders within the African continent. Africans should be free to move in their continent, to do business, to interact, if we are to grow the levels of investment and trade that will ensure that we are able to create the jobs for our people that we require. Welcome back. 15 minutes into the hour, you're watching Global Business Africa. Talks between Ghana's government and the International Monetary Fund on a support program have started after the successful sale by the West African country of a $1 billion euro bond. Now, the country, of course, is facing a variety of economic problems, including a weak currency, high inflation, rising public debt and a stubborn budget deficit. The hope in Ghana, however, is that aid from the IMF can give it a bit of time, a bit of breathing room to resolve these problems. But... At what cost? From Accra, here's Katerina Vitozzi. Since Tuesday, an IMF team from Washington has been looking at how to get Ghana's economy back on track. So far, the government struggled to balance the books. This year, Ghana's current account deficit is set to exceed more than 10% of gross domestic product. Top independent economists say there's a myriad of problems. You know, the budget has been under a lot of pressure. Um, we are not collecting enough revenues and the, and the expenditures have also, the levels have gone very high. Part of the problem on the expenditure side is the implementation of a new, uh, you know, pay policy, the single spine, which has put a lot of pressure on the budget. Um, but as I said, on the revenue side also, um, because the economy has slowed down, government is not collecting enough revenues. We already have a narrow you know, tax base. And then donor disbursements have also not been coming in as expected. Again, because of um, you know, donor uh, displeasure with uh, how the economy is being managed. Some of the country's trade unions have said they don't want the IMF involved in Ghana's recovery plan. They say it will lead to inevitable tax rises and budget cuts, but the government is forging ahead. Analysts say if they don't do it now, they certainly won't do it any closer to the presidential election in 2016. I think that this is the time for if the government wants to undertake some adjustment, this is the time to do it. And, uh, Maybe in a year's time, they will be, they will be over a bit and maybe they, they would have been able to stabilize the system 
and then and then we get into the elections you know but if they should delay it uh, the adjustment and the, the economic reforms then of course it will become more difficult to undertake those reforms uh, going into the election year in the short term, it's hoped a plan will calm investors and encourage a stabilisation of Ghana's currency, the CD. It's nosedived against the dollar this year, making everyday imports more expensive. Katerina Vitozzi, CCTV, Accra. Expensive would be quite the understatement, with inflation at 15.9% by the end of August. Let's get more from Daniel Rangers, who's live in Washington tonight. Um, Daniel, what exactly is on the agenda of these talks between IMF officials and Ghanaian authorities? Well, essentially, they're going to be trying to tackle the major problems just outlined there very eloquently by the reporter. And fundamentally speaking, that is this, uh, that uh, the level of spending is too high compared with what they're bringing in. So over 10 percent of GDP, even if you compare it to many African nations, that is very high. And that euro bond uh, sale of one billion dollars of bonds may have been successful, but it was costly eight and a quarter percent uh, interest rate on that. So that goes to basically erode the ability of the government to spend money on things it wants to. Um, and so, you know, uh, the Fitch Ratings Agency has estimated that Ghana is spending 20 percent of its revenues just on interest. So the IMF can provide a much uh, uh, more favorable interest rate going forward, but of course there will be strings attached. Essentially, the IMF will be the uh, strict parent that comes in and says, these are the things that we want to see happen if you get this money for cheap. Indeed, let's focus on the IMF's big stick here, so to speak. The steep rise in Ghana's wage bill, especially from 2012 onwards, is one of the main culprits for its current economic woes. And in February, the IMF essentially called, and I'm quoting here, for a specific program to reduce the public workforce. Words no African politician ever wants to hear, but are those job cuts still on the cards? They, they must be if Ghana wants in itself to be sustainable because uh, the IMF's estimated that the wage bill costs about 70% of revenues. So if you attach the 20% that goes on servicing the debt, you've only got 10% more to spend on other things and you can see why Ghana's in a lot of trouble here. So there is, there is going to have to be some painful concessions at some point. The IMF, I'm sure, is mindful and sensitive to the domestic political concerns of all the actors there. But at the same time, somebody has to come in and look at the situation and say, in the short term, you need to take some painful measures. In the medium and long term, this all could pay out very well for you. Uh, so I think they're going to be making the case in the end. But ultimately, I think it's down to the Ghanaian politicians to find ways to reach out to the public and to industry to say that we have to come back to a sustainable model here. Indeed, we'll have to leave it there for the time being. That's uh, Daniel Rangers there live in Washington. Let's make a quick run now through uh, commodity prices. Some fairly interesting developments here. Still very much in uh, contango mode, if you will, for you all traders out there, as far as crude is concerned. However, the interesting bit lies with gold, down over 100 basis points in trading today. Um, the thing is, according to the last meeting of the report, last report rather from the meeting between the IMF and Ghanaian authorities, if gold prices go to about a thousand and a thousand dollars per ounce, that could wipe out a significant part of the country's reserves altogether. So certainly one to watch in a little more detail. When we come back, we'll be looking at the vibrancy of one township in South Africa and how it moved an Algerian entrepreneur to support its women. All that and more is coming up. We're back in 30. back to the program. Townships are a vibrant part of South African daily life, despite initially having been formed for non-white people under apartheid. Today, they're characterized by high levels of poverty and unemployment, but they exude a pulsating energy, a vibrancy about them that gives rise to 
modern day fashion trends in music and art. Social entrepreneur Nicole Marie Eirek has tried to capture this culture through Township, a community sewing initiative aimed at empowering and helping women from disadvantaged communities to not only earn a living, but at the same time run their own businesses. Sumit Naidu has more. Algerian-born Nicole Marie Eresh was holidaying in Cape Town in 1987 when she was approached by a group of women who wanted work. Eresh fell in love with the vibrancy and energy of Kailicha, South Africa's second biggest township. And that's when the township label and the first sewing cooperative of its kind was born. I saw this uh, uh, branded wallpaper stick inside the shacks, very colorful, bright, uh, and uh, that has a big impact, a lot of vibration. And when I saw that, I said that has to go one day on a fabric, to print the fabric in such a way that the, the people from the township can benefit from it and create their own uh, economy. Township is now run using a network of seven women-owned cooperatives. Work is assigned on the level of skills and productivity at each cooperative. With the model that we use, which is a fair trade uh, model, uh, the members of the cooperative become members and equal partners of the cooperative. So it's already their businesses. But now we want them to actually develop these businesses where they can actually also create opportunities for other members of the community. Almost 100 women in the township have been empowered with sewing skills. Most of them now also own their own businesses. These women started uh, from nothing. They were, some of them didn't even know how to sew. And then they get this uh, township that they meet in Black Kid and they train them to sew. What I like from them, they have the passion to do what they like. The products made under the township label encapsulates township life through its designs. The cooperatives manufacture a range of products including clothes, shoes and conference bags. One of the first, very first photo I did was uh, this one of the two ladies. And you can see behind uh, the branded uh, uh, wallpaper and uh, this is uh, Lux uh, soap. Then you can see the shacks, the way they are uh, made. Uh, and uh, you can see the texture, the different texture, you can see the different color. So we capture all of that and threw that into fabrics, like here. And you see that one is called Kealicha fabric, is the first one uh, born uh, out of that project. One of Township's oldest and longest standing clients is South Africa's second biggest food and clothing retailer, Pick and Pay. Over 300,000 bags are manufactured for the local retailer every year. Township has also designed bags and clothes for celebrities such as Oprah, South African singing sensation Zolani, and the former First Lady of France, Carla Bruni Sarkozy. Bruni Sarkozy's bag became an overnight sensation and found a place at a high-end French boutique in Paris. We know that she likes big bags, she likes big, uh, to, to put a lot of things inside. So uh, we quickly designed a bag with uh, the color of the flag of South Africa, because at that time we didn't have our fabric. So we use a Hessian, so one side is red, yellow, green, like really South African. And inside, just to make sure she remembers us, we put a flag of South Africa made out of beads. And from township to big city, the township cooperative will soon celebrate the opening of its very first retail store in the heart of Cape Town at the world famous upmarket VNA Waterfront. Samit Ranadu, CCTV, Cape Town. And on the day that Jill Marcus announced that she would be stepping down in November, that's it for this edition of Global Business. Send your feedback on the program to globalbusinessafrica at cctv.com. And of course, wherever you are online, Facebook, Twitter, you name it, we're there. We'll see you around at the news all flow 24-7. I'm Ramanyang in Nairobi. Thanks for watching.